Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Vox Day Community. We're here in the sanctuary at Vox. This is John Bowles, pastor of Beggar's Table, and I'm Rustin Smith, the pastor here at Vox. And we're in uh, this long conversation that we're having about the Sermon on the Mount, this central revolutionary teaching of Jesus uh, that uh, we've just now completed, like, the first chapter. It goes from Matthew, roughly, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And today we get to begin the second chapter of that, Matthew 6. Last week, we talked about Jesus' uh, command for us to be perfect, uh, which we talked about in, in depth and kind of landed at this place about how this, this uh, command to be perfect is really an invitation toward a soft-heartedness and open-heartedness to, to, to be people who could receive the kingdom that he's talking about. And we warned last time that Jesus would then uh, enumerate some ways in, in which we could uh, go on that journey toward becoming soft-hearted people. Yeah. Do I got that right? That sounds good. Okay. Yeah, soft-hearted people, people of love. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not picking up on that you love my analogy of love actually, the whole <laughs> airport scene where people are hugging and all, but the reason I mention that is because Jesus Jesus uses the word telos in the be yeah. perfect as your Father in Heaven is imperfect. Me, and telos means like a vision or a picture yeah. more than um, like we think of perfection as a ledger yeah. and um, and so that's just one picture of, yeah. of great love and great giving yeah. and so anyway all of that so how, how do we go about getting that yeah. now I'll say this Rustin and of course I say this to all of us um, in the next section chapter 6 mm-hmm. uh, kind of provides us with instruction about how we go about becoming people of soft hearts and in this section, he mm-hmm. talks about three disciplines, spiritual mm-hmm. disciplines. He talks about um, giving, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and he's, and, and when, might as well say, when he talks about giving, he means like giving monetarily, mm-hmm. giving. And then he talks about prayer, mm-hmm. and he talks about fasting. And I think in a way, you and I want to cover all three of those, this whole pericope, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, seminary word. Mm-hmm. He wants to cover, uh, I think we want to cover all of that. And the reason we can do that is because even though Jesus mentions all three of those, I'm going to suggest that the emphasis isn't on those three practices in particular. So mm-hmm. the temptation is to look at it and go, well, we could give a sermon here yeah. on, on, on giving and one on prayer and one on fasting. And I have. Yeah, and we have before. <laughs> but if you look closely, even though Jesus mentions those three disciplines, and I tend to think that those are three, I'm not going to say they're random disciplines at all, but I, I do think they're three among many spiritual disciplines that we practice. I think um, if you look closely, the emphasis isn't on the disciplines themselves, but the emphasis is on one thing in particular about how we practice them when we practice them oh okay and by by the way i mean that in in the context the assumption is that you are practicing them there's never the if you do this it's always when you do this right yeah so i think that that was maybe more of a cultural thing that people then yeah part of their culture is that they 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 were they were expected to practice prayer Mm -hmm and fasting and giving, yeah. whereas today we have to back up and we have to do sermons about, maybe you should try this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, anyway, that, right. that could be a tangent. Yeah. I don't know if we yeah. want to. Well, it's all, it's all a tangent. It's all but a I do tangent. think it's important to, to situate this in the context mm-hmm. of this, uh, uh, Jesus giving us instruction. He's not like leaving us in abstraction about being soft-hearted people That's like right. he hasn't just preached a sermon to convict us and send us away from you know sunday morning gathering with a new conviction that, go be um, soft-hearted yeah yeah it's now i'm gonna i'm gonna give you examples about how you actually do this, do and, this. and i'm gonna contrast it with the way that you yeah. may be currently doing it or yeah some pitfalls of doing it so this is practical instruction it's practical instruction and again the focus he uses prayer and fasting and giving as um, as examples, mm-hmm. but uh, the focus of his okay. of, of what of the instruction mm-hmm. isn't on those practices. Okay. It's on something else, and that something else sticks out to us right at the beginning in the first verse of, of chapter six. All right. He says, "Be careful not to practice your righteousness." In other words, we would say spiritual disciplines or whatever. Don't mm-hmm. practice these things in front of others yeah. to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have 
no reward from your Father in heaven. Yeah. Uh, so immediately he couches all of this in do your, do your good deeds in practice. Do your spiritual disciplines in practice. The things that you're doing to draw you closer to God and to make your world better in your life, you know, mm -hmm. more godly. Do these things so that they're not done so that other people can see them. And that, that's really the context for everything he talks about from here on out. So when he talks about uh, giving, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing he says is don't give, when, or when you give, again, not if you give, but when you give, don't announce it with trumpets. Yeah. And then he's, he introduces, we'll talk more about this, he introduces this word hypocrites, that's what uh -huh. the hypocrites do. Yeah. And, 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 and when he talks about prayer, he says when you pray, again, not if you pray, but when you pray, yeah. And, and there's that word again, don't be like the hypocrites, yeah. who, and then he describes them, they pray on the street and on street corners for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. But he says, do it in private. And then, of course, when he talks about fasting, that's exactly what he says about fasting. When you fast, mm -hmm. don't do it in a way in which everyone can tell you're fasting, and oh boy, look at him, he's walking around in ashes and sackcloth, <laughs> right. you know, but, but wear your best clothes and do it. So, uh -huh. so the emphasis in this whole pericope which is just one section of teaching, basically, in Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, don't do it so that um, it's obvious for everyone, but do it only for your father mm -hmm. because uh, he sees what's done, and I like this phrase, yeah. in secret. In secret. In secret, yeah. So uh, anyway, mm -hmm. that is the emphasis of Jesus' teaching yeah. right there. That's really the focus of this thing. Even though he talks about prayer, fasting, and giving, he's really talking about secrecy. Secrecy. What, the first time I came across this is, was through Dallas Willard, who, who talked about the discipline of secrecy. And I thought, what is that? And, and yeah. it was fascinating. It was all about basically not publicizing yeah. your, your good deeds, your acts of righteousness. Yeah. yeah. So there's that. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know, Rustin, where we go from that. First of all, I mm -hmm. think it would be interesting maybe uh, to elaborate on this word hypocrite. Now, Jesus repeats it, yeah. and he talks a lot about that. And at first glance, it doesn't always make sense. It's like... Yeah. So when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. And I don't know, when I read that, I'm like, oh, you mean those people who don't really mean it. You know, they're yeah. not being authentic. Yeah. When you, when you give, don't do it like the hypocrites who aren't being authentic. And I think that that's kind of true. Yeah. It gets around to the point, but there's, more, yeah. there's a more direct implication here with yeah. the word. Right. Well, yeah, this is just fun uh, archaeology nerd stuff. Yeah, but right. It's, it's so illuminating in, in this case. Um, the, the first thing Jesus does though, is with this phrase that comes before that when he says, uh, don't practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. And in, in Greek, the original language, this is written down in, mm -hmm. to be seen is the, from, from that Greek word, we get the word theater, to be seen. It's mm -hmm. performative stage performance, uh, to be seen by others. But then this word hypocrite is also tied to the theater because in Greek, that word comes from the word for actor, stage actor. Mm -hmm. And so this is where archaeology comes in. And you know this stuff. I think you've probably taught it. That um, We know things today from archaeology that we didn't know even 100 years ago. But within a few miles, maybe five, six kilometers from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. Mm -hmm. Jesus, you remember, grew up the son of Joseph, who by trade was a a carpenter or a stonemason or something. Those are all mm -hmm. the same words, so we don't know. He was in construction of <laughs> some sort, right. craftsman. And uh, there's this town called Sephoris that's, that's five or six kilometers away from Nazareth where they have discovered this 4,500-seat uh, theater. It's one of the largest amphitheaters in the ancient world. This this was under construction when Jesus was a small boy. So it's not, uh, I mean, there's no way to know this, but it's not hard to imagine that Jesus grew up as an apprentice to his father, Joseph, uh, working with stone or wood or whatever they did as a family, that they would have been conscripted to help build that theater. Mm -hmm. Implication is Jesus grew up around the theater. He had intimate knowledge of what it meant to live on a stage, right? Or to know actors. Probably uh, he, he had grew up intimate in that knowledge, world. yeah. Yeah. So he's using language uh, from that world that he grew up in, the to be seen, the theater. Don't do this on stage, right? Mm -hmm. In front of other people. Uh, don't be like an actor. Yeah. 
when you do it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's interesting because the actor, you know, an actor, what makes an actor an actor is that they can play a role convincingly without ever actually intending to be the thing that they're, they're portraying. Mm -hmm. you, get, you get that? So one of my favorite performances, you can correct me on this since you're, you're more of a film guy than I am. Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. Um, he played Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. in, in the Lincoln film, right? Mm -hmm. it, it was good. Mm -hmm. So good. So moving. Mm -hmm. uh, so convincing. Uh, but he got nominated for an Oscar for that. Did he win the Oscar for that? <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't remember. You know that. what? I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say I don't think so, but I could be way wrong. Uh, he might have. Can I say, can't. Uh, he might have. It wouldn't have been a surprise if he had. He's, he's a brilliant actor. It's the kind of thing it's I should know. Performance. I'm more ashamed about not knowing yeah. that than not knowing <laughs> memorizing scripture. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody I, will comment and tell yeah, us. Yeah, right. But the, the idea is Daniel Day Lewis gets gets nominated for an award for a performance like that. Yeah. Because he's acting. Right. Now he's doing it so convincingly that we're not sure. But the fact is if Daniel Day Lewis actually thought he was Abraham Lincoln, if he actually thought he was going to be elected president because he was in that role. We wouldn't give him an award. <laughs> We'd refer him to a counselor. Right. Right. There'd right. be something wrong with him. Something's wrong with so him. So the whole idea of acting is that you're able to, you're doing something without the intention of actually becoming yeah. that. So that's awesome in the theater. Yeah. That's what you want. But now Jesus is going to turn that into a moral teaching mm. about giving and praying and fasting. And just listen to this. This is what Dallas Willard says about this word hypocrisy mm -hmm. and, and the use uh, of it by Jesus. By the way, Jesus, the word hypocrite is used 17 times in the New Testament. Mm. Every time it's used, it's used by Jesus. Yeah. Um, Dallas Willard said this, it's clear from the literary records that it was Jesus alone who brought this term hypocrisy and the corresponding character into the moral record of the Western world. It's ironic that even when precisely when we criticize the church for producing hypocrites. We pay tribute to this man, Jesus, whose teaching gave us the picture of, of hypocrisy that shapes our moral understanding 2,000 years later. Mm. And I think that's uh, it's such a great insight and commentary because there was a survey done years ago about hypocrisy and uh, something like 75% of the people outside the church um, when they thought of going to church or the people in the church they the word that comes to their mind is hypocrite interesting right? yeah and so that's that's funny <laughs> i mean it's brutal in one way yeah right and accurate um we, we, although although we shouldn't be too hard on people i love right you know somebody said but it's a way of saying at least perception from yeah, a lot of people is perception. that the church has become theater theater it, yeah with... it's people pretending to be something they have no intention of actually being actually <laughs> right so it's ironic though because that's true and it's a devastating critique of the church at the same time when one is making that critique you're at the very same time paying tribute to jesus himself who is the person who has gathered the church together and yeah. so i kind of laugh it off because hypocrites aren't unique to church i mean hypocrites are everywhere and uh, i like what what yeah. somebody said that you know if you say you won't go to church because it's full of hypocrites well, that's not true. We always have room for more. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. When you were saying that, it just reminded me of, uh, again, tangents are like my field of expertise, so forgive <laughs> me. But it reminded me of this podcast I was just listening to last night called uh, Nice White Parents. Have you heard about this mm. at all? Yeah. No. So this, uh, this reporter was talking about she was doing investigative research uh, in, in New York City in the 1960s, there were all these white parents who were pushing for integrated schools, yeah. and they had written letters pushing for integration. Yeah. And um, she was following up on those parents, and what she found is that even though they had written these letters, they actually hadn't sent their kids to the uh, school, right. the, the integrated school, because they were too scared to. So she kept saying over and over again, 
so you didn't really mean to do this. Yeah. You didn't really yeah. mean to do this. It, it was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. You liked the idea. And then, over and over again, that was a theme. It, we loved the idea. But when it came down to sending our kids, we had no intention of doing yeah. it. You know, yeah. and, there's a, and not to be harsh on these people, because I, I totally get that, but yeah. there is this um, hypocrisy level of I am, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not really wanting to, to be this. I'm not really right. wanting to change, yeah. I want to appear, yeah. and I want all of the benefits of having appeared to be this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Rustin, would you say <laughs> that there is any, is this relevant today? Is, <laughs> is, there, is there any obsession with our appearance today or, yeah. or making ourselves public so that everyone can see? Does that sound relevant so, at so, all? It sounds like only an ancient problem. <laughs> only an ancient problem. <laughs> There's no... There's no Nothing social media. <laughs> right. There's no Twitter. Yeah. There's no Facebook. There's no Instagram. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it's 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 so funny because I feel like this might be more relevant now than ever. Yeah. Because we live in an age where everything is made public. Yeah. So people oh, can see. Yeah. Right. I mean, you and I could be having lunch and we could just be having a fine time. Yeah. But then we might decide that we want everyone to see our lunch, which I see happening as you do all the time. Yeah. And we, um, and, and so we'll pose for yeah. a picture and we'll make sure we're really smiling and having a great time. And then we'll take the picture and then we'll just go back to our lunch. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> this is the world we live in. I, how many yeah. times have you seen people posing yeah, and sure. taking pictures of the food? And I'm yeah. not saying any of it's wrong or bad. I'm just yeah. saying we live in a time where we live incredibly public lives. Yeah. Even the most private person is tempted to live really publicly. Yeah. So here we are with Jesus saying, in, in a way, I would say at most he's saying, he's not saying stop that as much as he's saying, you be careful. You be careful. Be careful. That's how he begins this. Yeah. Be careful. Be Take careful. care. Take care. You know, this is a, a funny little story, but when our church participated in one of the protests that were happening this summer mm -hmm. on the plaza. Yeah. And so we're down there and we uh, walked a bit with this, community very i was very self-conscious of the fact that we were white people um and the last thing i want to do is like start taking center stage like yeah. now everybody listen to me you know it was i'm there to learn i'm there to hear to listen to be mm -hmm. quiet but then we noticed there was a guy who was praying and he was praying and uh he had he, he had a circle around him and he was standing on the street praying and he was praying loudly and his prayers were for forgiveness and repentance so there was nothing wrong with his prayers it was all it was all fine but he was praying i mean you could have heard him a block away he was praying really loudly he had a circle of people around him it's worth noting that they were all white people and um and again please hear me because i'm not i'm not saying right or wrong here i'm not like oh well he was just wrong but the thought did cross my head <laughs> Dude, <laughs> not often do can we look at our behavior and say, I'm literally doing what Jesus said not to do, <laughs> but you're literally standing on the street praying so everyone can see you and hear you. And I, and I, I kind of, rather than getting mad about it, I kind of chuckle inside and I'm like, I think to myself, is there not, is there a little part of you that wondered about that? <laughs> that was like, boy, I better be careful yeah. before I do this because I'm stepping into a role that Jesus said, yeah. don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a constant though, isn't it? And yeah. I know your, your heart is, is like mine in this that, um, well, we've, but we've both had a lot of struggles as church leaders over the years because of this tension between, uh, you know, wanting to be public and let your light shine before men and, and, Mm -hmm. uh, communication as hospitality. Yeah. Uh, you want to be. We always say hospitality is the heart of the gospel here at Vox, and uh, you want to be hospitable. At the same time, you want to obey Jesus and practice secrecy mm -hmm. and not make much of yourself constantly. And I feel like that as a church, that's been a constant battle for us. You know, to to want to be hospitable to for the community to know we're here and to know us for the right reasons. We're in a while, while not bragging about yeah. the good that we're doing, right? It's hard for the body, and, and you and I have particularly hard jobs that way because they mm -hmm. are public jobs, kind of like politicians yeah. and the fact that we're in the public eye. Yeah. And, and, and part of our job is to be seen, and so we wrestle with this tension. I think yeah. every pastor does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, one of the examples I, that came to my mind is we have this blessing box out here in our driveway, a blessing box, just a place where people can drop off dried goods, and then people who mm -hmm. need them can come pick up whatever they can use. and. 
it's just a you know, freely given, freely received things. One, once in a while, somebody will complain that the wrong people are taking stuff, but I just kind of laugh at that because I'm like, ah, is that the point? That <laughs> we're, all, we're all the wrong people. We're all the wrong people. Um, but I remember when we first put it up, uh, people from the community would participate in it, which was awesome, but they would often post selfies on Facebook of, you know, they'd fill it up and post their selfie. That's the same and, thing. Yeah. And so on yeah, one yeah. hand, I love it because they're helping spread the word and, and good for them. They're I mean, making they're, the church look good. Yeah, and they're, yeah. yeah they're right. They're bringing the right kind of attention to what we're doing. At the same time, I, as somebody who's just like deeply meditated on this, this Jesus teaching, uh, it always made me cringe a little. I'm like, ah, shit, you might have just undid any good that you did there. Yeah, but, yeah. That's, that's the same yeah. kind of thing. I, what I do is yeah. I, I just want, I wonder what goes through a person's head when yeah. they're doing that. Like, I, I'm just hoping that everyone has, goes through the consideration. Like, well, yeah. okay, let me think this through. Okay, all right, and then we'll Probably do not, it. and it's yeah. probably fine. Uh, I just, Ash Wednesday selfie is another one of my things that makes me cringe a little bit. You know, you get your ashes, and then you take your selfie and put it on Facebook. Like, it's kind of the opposite of yeah. But it's, stand, it's probably fine. I mean, I you know, you, you know, know. It's, a, it's an internal kind of posture. And are you doing it in order to be seen? Or, I mean, in some ways that helps spread the word. And We don't want to uh, sound judgy. No. But you know what? We're standing beside yeah. Jesus saying, please be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Because this is, this, is, <laughs> this is the stuff that will shape your heart. And you know what, yeah. what I always get from this? It's not so much like if you do these things so other people will see in the selfies yeah. that you're like going to go to hell or anything like that. <laughs> I, I always think what the, the real emphasis here is... If, if you care about your heart being changed, yeah. you have to watch your motivations because it all has to do with motivation. And so you can really help your heart change by stopping yourself from taking yeah. that selfie. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. because of secrecy. There's mm -hmm. something about secrecy, about doing this, this thing that other people aren't going to see that profoundly shapes us in this Jesus way. Yeah. Well, what do you think's behind that? Why? Why does Jesus emphasize? I mean, this is an emphasis. This is a big chunk of the Sermon yeah. on the Mount. It's like a sixth of the sermon yeah. he's spending talking about secrecy. So, Rustin, I've got an answer for that. I've got one answer, but I'm going to ask you a question first. Okay. Um, <laughs> just because you shared with me a story about your church participating in one of the protests this summer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it was, mm -hmm. and you gave your church an interesting directive. Yeah. And I just want you to share that. And then I well, want to ask you, why did you, share, why did you ask your church to do that? Yeah. yeah. Well, we, yeah, we went to one of the prayer uh, things down mm -hmm. on Troost. And, and one of, you know, we're out here in the suburbs. Belton is, is not that racially diverse. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we want to do our part. And I'm moved, and I'm, I'm all about the kingdom coming, and I want to always approach these kinds of historical moments with this attitude of what can I do to help, and how can I be part of a, the solution. And So there was a small group of Vox people who felt like I did, and, and we went down to this, this event, this protest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we just agreed ahead of time to be like, hey, we're not going to take pictures, no, no selfies, no photos. We're not... We don't want to go in there to make much of us. We just want to go and pray. I mean, that's the whole point, is I, to pray. I just want to pause for yeah. a second. I want to let that soak in. <laughs> um, I love the fact that you did that, but what mm -hmm. you just said mm -hmm. as a pastor of your church mm -hmm. is, guys, we're not going to be taking selfies yeah. and photos. And I'll quote you, we're not going to think much of us. Yeah. That's, that's amazingly yeah. pastoral. I, well, thanks. I, yeah. Yeah. I, to me, it's just very pragmatic of like, if you actually think that prayer matters, that you're communing with the living God, mm -hmm. then isn't that enough? Do we also have to make it a marketing opportunity? Now, I've suffered plenty from being terrible at marketing. <laughs> but this is, that's, that's beautiful because that's, that's, why, but that's why I'm friends with you. Well, it's because you just said, do we have to make everything a marketing we, opportunity? Yeah. Do you know how few pastors would ever yeah. say that? Well, I'm not a real successful pastor in that but sense. None but none of us are. That's yeah. awesome. Put it there. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm marketing for you. This guy is amazing. I do want people yeah. to come to Vox yeah. and to know, and know us for the right do reasons. Do we have to make everything a marketing opportunity? Uh, Does it have to yeah. be? Yeah. Well, I just, I just want to, pra for me, I want to orient my heart to this. I, I either want prayer to matter or not. And if it matters, then I don't need to do the other stuff. That's Okay. Maybe, maybe I'm being too simplistic. And, no, I love that. You know... Rustin, circling back to the first question that you asked me, mm -hmm. I, I think that this, I think there's something here in the way that we're wired. Yeah. And um, 
And so I'll throw this into the, into the mixing yeah. bowl. So here. this is the why secrecy thing that you were, you were evading just a moment ago. <laughs> why, why secrecy? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and again, that's a, that's a complicated question. There's a lot of answers probably. So, but yeah. here's one thing to think about, like I said, to throw into a mixing bowl of, of answers. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's something to this idea that the way that we're created as humans is that we're created in, in, in a way in which we're called to, in, in which, no, not that we're called to, in which we just naturally live in front of an audience. Hmm. I think that we, uh, I think that whether we acknowledge it or not, or whether we realize it or not, all of us are wired in a way in which there's perpetually an audience in front of us. Hmm. Um, now, in, in, in other words, when I do things, when I say things, when I, when I perform, I'm always performing for somebody, and it's never just me or sometimes it is just me i guess maybe i'm part of my audience okay some of our audience is real you know uh our spouse um i'm i'm doing things before mm -hmm. carrie who i'm married to mm -hmm. so, uh, our boss our kids uh our neighbors um sometimes our audience is not real now before i get into that i'll just say uh, children get this more than adults hmm. like children know and are really just kind of innocent about the fact that, yeah, I'm performing in front of imagine, an imaginary audience, oh, too. Of course. Yeah. Um, so for me, I have probably more stories than I should share about my imaginary audience <laughs> as a child. But, but I'll just put it this way. You know, I, um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I had a game that I played in my backyard that was a football with a Nerf football. Oh, yeah. I had my Nerf ball, and I loved my Nerf ball. And it involved me being a quarterback yep. and throwing the ball onto our roof. And then I would transition into a receiver, yep. you know, and run up and catch, catch it. it. Sure. Do all kids play that? Uh, Did I, you play I that? that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. But when I'm out there playing that as a kid, I'm, I look like I'm by myself. Yeah. But I'm not by myself. Yeah. Not only is there a whole team there, there is a stands of yeah, thousands yeah. Right. watching me right the and roar of the crowd the roar of the crowd yeah. i can hear it all the time yeah. and i would always narrate with the announcer from television that's right? what i was about to say John. the announcers were really yeah. important to me like he takes the snap he drops back the announcers yeah. loved me of course i think they called me golden arm golden when i would arm. throw it you know <laughs> <laughs> so now the thing is that's cute when it's childish child ch children doing it but yeah. it's it that kind of thing stays with us into okay. adulthood and um yeah. And sometimes there are fun stories about the people that we imagine ourselves talking to yeah. uh, or performing for, but sometimes yeah. there are hard stories. You know, I remember uh, years ago I was counseling uh, a guy who was going through some stuff, and I remember it dawning on me that he was performing before an audience, and his audience was his mother. Wow. And his mother had been dead for 10 years. Oh. But he still lived with the, yeah. and this is common for us, he still yeah. lived with the, the, the audience of his mom yeah. judging and critiquing every decision that he made in the way he lived. That's an example that we live before yeah. people. Surely we all do that. I can mm -hmm. think of college professors and, um, and certainly deceased relatives and, and people who I draw to mind for mm -hmm. trying to make good decisions and trying to honor, honor yeah. them and, yeah. or to ask what would they do or, yeah. I totally get We're it. We're profoundly relational <clears throat> beings. I think Henry now and, you know, wrote about this that if you, if you want to know whether or not we're relational just just the fact that even when you're by yourself our our, our thoughts are are occupied by our relationships with other people connected we're yeah we're just so deeply connected yeah i think it's one reason our dreams always involve people that you know yeah. that we know and yeah mm -hmm. anyway yeah. um all that to say in in i appreciate you saying that because this is in no way saying what's right or wrong i mean i just i i think it is i think this is how we are yeah um and that's part of the profound relationship we have with our parents whether your parents were healthy parents or mm -hmm. unhealthy parents yeah we're profoundly linked and so even at my age i am still thinking of my parents and running things through my parents and, and right. seeking approval um so anyway yeah. all that to say i think that this rather than ignore this aspect of the way that we're made, I think that there's a clue here in the discipline that Jesus is directing us to. Okay. And probably the guy that said it best is Oz Guinness, um, mm. or at least that I remember is Oz Guinness, when he said that we need to perform in our lives, mm -hmm. but we need to practice the discipline of performing before an audience of one. Mm. In other words, to everything that we just said, our parents, friends, spouses, add God. 
God is also someone who is watching us. And sure enough, Jesus says, yeah, over and over again That's in this right. pericope, yeah. uh, your father in heaven who sees you, he yeah. sees you. And in fact, you can do things in private and you still have an audience that's not imaginary. You have an audience who's very real, mm-hmm. and he sees you. Um, so I love this theme. Jesus is kind of playing, if you think about it, on that theater theme over and over again, yeah. because he's talking about performing and being seen. Yeah. And you've got an audience in God who always sees. Yeah. And rather than spinning that to be something negative, like, you better shape up, because God's always watching, <laughs> it's, it's positive. It's like, hey, yeah. when you go and, and you pray in your room by yourself, yeah. God sees, you know, that's yeah. an audience that still sees you. And, and rather than thinking that, that that's bad, yeah. cultivate that. Begin to cultivate your life so that you're playing to God, you know, mm-hmm. in, in, in only him. Yeah. So that other people might or they might not see the things that you do. But the point is that God sees yeah. and, and, and live that way. Right. Yeah. So when I think of that, I hear I hear it echoing what you said about, listen, when we go out and we do this, um, let's consciously not take selfies and pictures mm-hmm. because and because this is enough. This prayer is enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that fair? I hope. Yeah. I hope that's true. I, I, I think that's all true. I think our I mean, you, you just one just has to bring to mind their own solitude. Mm-hmm. And when you're alone, what comes to mind or mm-hmm. when you're making a big decision, what comes to mind? What mm-hmm. sort of critic? Uh, critical voices is it really your own voice or is it the voice of a mother or a school teacher or Mm -hmm. um but this uh, the flip side of that is this audience of one thing it's so beautiful and uh this idea that we are never alone we can be apart from other people but we're never alone because god always sees and god is always with us so perhaps what you're getting at is this <laughs> is this discipline of secrecy is a way of cultivating seeing through that lens that we are not here to please to to live up to the expectations of of one another or or old professor or yeah um, but it's God's opinion of us is yeah. the, is the one that actually matters yeah. and if we can orient our behaviors our actions our choices according to what is pleasing to God according to his design. Yeah. Um, that's going to profoundly change our lives over time. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I like that. I like thinking of this audience of one because to me, it protects me against like a reverse pride. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure that there's a pride as, as much as there's a pride in performing for other people there. It could also be a pride in getting too consumed with not being in front of people. I think that uh, as long as I say whether in front of people or not in front of people, yeah. I'm in front of God, and that's what matters. Yeah. And and so, you and I have a public job. Yeah. And so you take sermons, for example, and yeah, people will hear this and see this. <laughs> yeah. With my fingers crossed, people yeah. will hear and see this. That's not always true at beggars, but we hope it is. <laughs> but people will hear and see it. Yeah. And you know as much as anyone that I can, and I'm sure you can too, I can become really dependent on feedback that I get from people. I want to hear that I'm good and that I want to hear that I changed lives and that everything, <laughs> right. you know, but rather than being dependent on that, just know that God also hears and sees and is intimately involved in my heart and the whole process yeah. of the thing. And so that changes the whole way that I approach the sermon itself. Yeah. And, 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 but that's what matters. Yeah. And yeah. That's good. It reminds me, I, this may be too much, it all may be too much, uh, but I had a mentor years ago, an old monk, who uh, talked to me one time about the affirmation, you know, that we all so desperately want as public people, um, mm. and he, he asked me if I played baseball when I was a kid, and of course I did, not very well, mm. but he asked me if I ever stole second, that's something I did do once in a while, if I, sure. if I ever got to first. Every kid does when I you're w- young. I yeah. was fast enough to steal yeah. second. I couldn't always hit the ball to get the first, but when I did. Yeah. Uh, so he's like, you, what happens? You steal second, you slide into second, what do you do? And I was a little confused by it. And he, eventually he led me to this idea that, well, you stand up and you, you dust your pants off. You just slid in the dirt and you, you dust off. And he's like, so when you're, you, you steal the base and you're safe, what do you do? You dust your pants off. You steal the base and you get tagged out, what do you do? You still stand up and you dust your pants off. And he used that as a metaphor in my life of sometimes you're going to preach the sermon and people are going to love it. 
sometimes you're going to make the decision uh, and get it wrong or, or just receive a lot of critique um, that you didn't want. Uh, either way, at the end of the day, you stand up, you dust your pants off. You don't take too seriously the, kind, you know, the, the affirmation or the critique um, because all that matters is that you ran hard mm. and, you, and you slid well. Mm -hmm. And it's really you're doing it before God and not mm. and not for the result anyway. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's wonderful. Something thanks. I've carried with me. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, I have a quote that I might uh, leave us on, if that's yeah, all let's right. Do it. Um, and and just as a teaser for next week, if you guys are savvy and and you know Matthew six or you've been looking at the scripture while we're talking, you're like, well, this is the this is the pericope that contains Jesus' teaching on the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And that is something, he does zero in on prayer a little bit more than the others and gives us an example of yeah. a prayer. And that's important enough, not just in the, in, in, in the context of his teaching, but in our tradition, in our church tradition, yeah. that we're going to circle back to that next week and talk a little bit more about the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Um, but in... In, in focusing on what Jesus' focus was in this teaching on doing these good deeds in secret so only our Father in Heaven sees us. Mm -hmm. or, I want to leave us with this quote from Dallas Willard. And again, one of the reasons this is special to me is because Dallas Willard was really fundamental in my life in helping me to understand what this discipline was. Mm -hmm. and, and he says, first of all, in the practice of secrecy, we experience a continuing relationship with God independent of the opinion of others, mm. which is so important because it's not that there aren't opinions of others. It's just that our relationship with God's not dependent on opinions of others. Mm -hmm. So again, Rustin, I don't want to go off on tons of tangents mm. and I don't want to be inappropriately vulnerable, but the opinions of others has always been a huge stumbling block for me. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I've, I've had to work hard to not see myself the way others see me. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that because I know I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. I know that people in yeah. general struggle with that. Yeah. So that's one of the beauties of the discipline of secrecy mm -hmm. is that it can help free us from worrying about the opinions of others yeah. because the opinion of God is what matters. Yeah. So he says, God becomes our public relations expert. <laughs> We allow him to decide when our deeds will be known and when our light will be noticed. Our deeds will be known. Our light will be noticed. Jesus just got through, as you said, telling us to shine, let our lights shine bright. Yeah. But when they're known and how they're noticed and when they're noticed, all of that is up to God because it's he's our God. public relations expert. That's right. So that's a great word, I think, for us to meditate on, to think about, and yeah. to try to incorporate into our lives. That's good. Yeah. Well, thanks for the conversation. Yeah, thanks, John. May it be. Amen. Amen.